what's happening in particular when it comes to opera and the orchestras of America is crazy. I didn't realize for a long time that most of these big orchestras that you see, if you go to see the symphony, to get into the symphony, to get try out for that kind of an orchestra, you have to go behind a closed door, like behind a screen. So they don't, they intentionally are, are trying to pick only the very, very best musicians no longer because that somehow where you actually literally didn't know the person's race, race is racist. <laughs> That's racist too. It, it, it never ends. After George <laughs> Floyd, every single classical music organization put out these puling, nauseating statements, beating their chest, saying, woe is me, we're so racist, we are in a racist tradition, uh, our audiences are too white, our, our the composers we play are too white, we, we will never forget our mission today is anti-racism. No, it's not. Your mission is making, is presenting a tradition of unparalleled sublimity in as perfect a manner as you can, in as expressive a manner as you can, without regard to identity. Uh, I do not, as you say, you do not need to see some female walking through the door or a fi female firefighter in order to feel validated. I don't need to hear a female composer in order to feel that I have reached some further understanding of the movement of the human soul. If I am listening to Bach or Mozart or Chopin or late Brahms piano music, I am experiencing feelings that I otherwise would never have had access to. And I could not care less whether I'm listening to a male or a female composer. The same goes with the race of composers. Uh, there are some fantastic Black composers. They're not the ones that are being promoted now. There's some real mediocrities that are out there. Um, but music is not about race. And yet you have the leaders of our classical music organizations, whether it's the director of the, of the Metropolitan Opera, they're all, they faced an incredible budget catastrophe during COVID because they closed down, they lost their audiences, they had no money coming in. And yet, even though they hire in a blind fashion, they do not discriminate against any group or any sex. All these organizations that were in near bankruptcy hired way overpriced diversity consultants mm. that have no musical background. Their only expertise is that they're black and they come in at you know, a hundred thousand, two hundred, five hundred thousand dollars a year plus staff to go around saying, "Well, you don't have enough black musicians in your orchestras." We don't know who's auditioning when they're black. Conductors only want the best musicians. They don't give it. They're perfectionists. They're tyrants. They're they're taskmasters. But the thing they're not is discriminators against talent. All they care is, I do I want a horn player that won't flub the solo in a Richard Strauss tone poem, and if it's that's a a Nigerian, please come and be in my orchestra because I want the best talent. Right. But again, they would say, well, chicken and the egg. We we haven't fostered the arts for whole communities in the United States. We haven't lit the fire of love for music in a lot of these inner cities. And therefore, they don't fall in love with the cello. They don't fall in love with the violin. And they're never going to have this opportunity until maybe we help them get into college. And then something happens and they they fall in love with it. And then maybe they're behind. And so they need, they need a leg up because of the past historical discrimination. And we'll give them that leg up. And maybe they won't be the soloist, but what's wrong with giving them a, a pathway into the larger orchestra when they've never historically had it and there are bad reasons for that? Well, actually, they did have it. Uh, there was actually there was definitely heartbreaking discrimination against black musicians. On the other hand, there were very many that were promoted, that were given conducting ships, uh, Pulitzer Prizes, fellowships. And in fact, the orchestra profession since the 1960s has been bending over backwards with one inner city fellowship program after another to, to say that the contemporary, the mid 20th century orchestra was not concerned with trying to provide educational opportunities is completely wrong. Uh, they send musicians into schools and again, they, they give fellowships and they, they try and cultivate talent. Uh, but we, it, the fault is not that we somehow excluded inner city students from music education. We've cut music education back completely. And I talk about some black violinists who did get exposed 
through their public schools back in the 1940s and 1950s in Detroit of all places. There were orchestras in, in, in schools, two or three sometimes, a black violinist, Joseph Striplin, who now leads a, a community orchestra in Virginia. He grew up, he said, with a traditional inner city single mother, but he got it in his schools. And he, he had students, fellow students that had private lessons and he listened to them. He said, wow, they really play the violin. I better start studying more. So the solution is, uh, yes, better education across the board. It would be great if classical music wasn't so completely alien now in our culture, but the solution is not to lower standards at the end of the line. Uh, and Asian students are absolutely, again, whooping everybody's ass. Orchestras are way, way disproportionate Asian because of the home environment that the parents, these tiger moms are saying, not only are you going to study calculus in the ninth grade, but you're going to play both the violin and the piano. Yeah. <laughs> and China, yeah. um, you know, they've got 300 million students studying piano today. It's fantastic. If China ever decides that, oh, actually, you know, Harvard is not paying any attention to the fact that I'm showing up with three instruments. I still am discriminated against that. Maybe there's no point in my learning uh, instruments if it's not being driven by actual love of music, then classical music's over. Experts say that China is hoarding a massive amount of food. They will soon have over two-thirds of the globe's corn reserves, over half of its rice, and over half of its wheat. But when asked about it, China misleads. One China expert says they, of course, will never admit to something like that. But what does China know that we don't? When it comes to global food shortages, China may be the canary in the cold mine. Coal mine. You see, China is the world's number one food importer. They rely on the rest of the world to keep their people fed. So they cannot afford to mess up. There could be riots, there could be civil panic, or worse. That's why it's a smart idea to stock up on a kit of the best selling Four Patriots survival food. Create your own stockpile of the best selling Four Patriots survival food kits. Hand packed in the USA, the kits are compact and stack easily. They have different delicious breakfasts, lunches, and dinners, and their five star reviews on the website rave about the flavor and taste. Right now, you can get 10% off your first purchase of Four Patriots survival food by typing in the code MK at checkout. Just go to the numeral 4patriots.com and use code MK to get 10% off your first purchase of Four Patriots Survival Food. That's 4patriots.com. Use the code MK. Hey, thanks so much for watching. If you like what you just saw, hit the subscribe button for more clips and full episodes.